How do you spend your time while in isolation during a coronavirus pandemic? Well, I decided I would make an instructional video. So welcome to my first video lesson. The topic is respiratory physiology, and in particular, we will consider three things. The first is the most important buffer system in the body, the CO2 bicarbonate system. We will then discuss an important mathematical equation that relates hydrogen ion concentration to arterial bicarbonate concentration in CO2. And lastly, we will consider the inverse relationship between PCO2 and alveolar ventilation. We will begin by considering this clinical scenario. If you do not understand this scenario or these questions, then you should probably move on to another video. However, if this is familiar, then stay tuned. I trust that you will gain a better understanding of some important medical concepts. An elderly patient with a history of severe COPD presents with shortness of breath. Arterial blood gas analysis demonstrates pH equals 7.20 and pCO2 equals 80 millimeters of mercury. The first question is what is this patient's serum bicarbonate level? The second question asks, if this patient's usual pH equals 7.40, then what is his usual pCO2? One approach to these questions is to use an acid-base nomogram. I do not recommend this. I find this nomogram to be overly complicated, unintuitive, and frankly not very useful. I hope to show you an easier, more logical approach to understanding this material. However, before going further, I would like you to look at the variables in this nomogram. The vertical axis is plasma bicarbonate concentration and is expressed in millimoles or milliequivalents per liter. The normal value is 24. The bottom horizontal axis is pH from 7.0 to 7.8, and the top horizontal axis is hydrogen ion concentration expressed in nanomoles per liter. In the center of this nomogram are curves that correspond to various PCO2 levels. So our variables are pH, hydrogen ion concentration, serum bicarbonate level, and CO2. Note that a pH of 7.0 corresponds to a hydrogen ion concentration of 100 nanomoles per liter. And a normal pH value of 7.40 corresponds to a hydrogen ion concentration of 40 nanomoles per liter. So let's leave this complicated nomogram behind and consider carbon dioxide, CO2. Carbon dioxide, an odorless, colorless gas, is produced by all aerobic organisms. In solution, carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid, H2CO3, which in turn rapidly dissociates to hydrogen and bicarbonate ions. In vivo, carbonic acid concentrations are so minuscule that it is convenient to ignore carbonic acid. We will consider carbonic acid to be an intermediary compound and focus on this chemical equation that illustrates the important connection between carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, and hydrogen ion. From this chemical reaction and the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, we can write that hydrogen ion concentration equals a constant times PCO2 divided by bicarbonate level. When hydrogen ion concentration is expressed in nanomoles per liter, PCO2 in millimeters of mercury, and serum bicarbonate levels in milliequivalents per liter, then at body temperature, this constant equals 24. We will ignore units of the constant, and this equation becomes hydrogen ion concentration equals 24 times PCO2 divided by serum bicarbonate level. Recall that under normal conditions, hydrogen ion concentration equals 40 nanomoles per liter, PCO2 equals 40 millimeters of mercury, and serum bicarbonate level equals 24 milliequivalents or millimoles per liter. Remarkably, this straightforward equation offers us all the information buried in that complicated acid-base nomogram. Now, although this is a tremendously important and useful equation. Unfortunately, most of us have been taught to think about hydrogen ion concentration as a logarithmic term pH and not as a nanomolar concentration of hydrogen ion. 
Before we consider applications of this equation, let us consider the relationship between pH and hydrogen ion concentration. The term pH is used to describe the acidity of a water-based solution. As you know, pH is defined as the negative log base 10 of the molar hydrogen ion concentration. A solution with a low pH is more acidic than a solution with a higher pH. Since we are interested in nanomolar concentrations of hydrogen ions, note that 1 nanomole per liter equals 10 to the minus 9th mole per liter equals pH of 9.0. A solution with a hydrogen ion concentration of 10 nanomoles per liter equals 10 to the minus 8th mole per liter, which equals a pH of 8.0. And as we saw on the nomogram, a 100 nanomole per liter hydrogen ion concentration equals 10 to the minus 7th mole per liter, which equals a pH of 7.0. There are several ways you can convert nanomoles of hydrogen ion concentration to pH. One way is to use a calculator to make the conversion. Alternatively, if you just remember that the log of 2 is about 0.3, you may obtain many pH values without a calculator. If we add or subtract 0.3 to a pH value, it will either double or halve the value of the corresponding hydrogen ion concentration. Let me demonstrate with this table. The left column is pH values from 6.7 to 8.0. The right column is hydrogen ion concentration expressed in nanomoles per liter. As we know, at a pH of 7.0, the hydrogen ion concentration is 100 nanomoles per liter, and that at a pH of 8.0, the hydrogen ion concentration is 10 nanomoles per liter. We also know that the hydrogen ion concentration halves or doubles every 0.3 pH units, so we can fill in many of the blank values in this table. If you start with a pH equal 8.0 and move up by increments of 0.3, you find that hydrogen ion concentration increases from 10 at a pH of 8.0 to 160 at pH equal 6.8. If you begin at pH equals 7.0, you can calculate values of hydrogen ion concentrations that range from 200 nanomoles per liter at pH equals 6.7 down to 13 nanomoles per liter at pH of 7.9. Putting everything together, we see that we have all but four values in this table. However, if you look at the pairs of hydrogen ion concentration values, you can see that the lower value of the pair is 80% that of the upper value. Or you could say that the upper value is 25% greater than the lower value. This relationship allows us to calculate these intermediate values shown in red and to complete our table. So now let's return to our clinical scenario. An elderly patient with a history of severe COPD presents with shortness of breath. Arterial blood gas analysis demonstrates pH equals 7.20 and PCO2 equals 80 millimeters of mercury. The question is, what is this patient's serum bicarbonate level? By using our equation, we find that when PCO2 equals 80 and hydrogen ion concentration equals 64, then solving for bicarbonate, we find that serum bicarbonate level equals 30 milliequivalents per liter. If this patient's usual arterial pH equals 7.40, and his usual serum bicarbonate level equals 30 millimoles per liter, what is his usual PCO2? We can answer the second equation by noting that with a usual hydrogen ion concentration of 40 and a bicarbonate concentration of 30, then using this equation we find that this patient's usual PCO2 must be 50 millimeters of mercury. Note that our patient has an underlying chronic respiratory acidosis and compensated metabolic alkalosis. This flashback to our acid-base nomogram signifies that we are ready to move on to the second portion of this lesson where we will examine the relationship between ventilation and PCO2. Let's start by considering the terms respiration and ventilation. Respiration refers to a cellular process by which oxygen enters cell and CO2 is removed from cells. Ventilation may be simply understood as the amount of new air that we breathe. Ventilation brings oxygen into the body and removes CO2 from the body. Ventilation may be measured as the volume of air in each breath or as the volume of air that we breathe each minute. 
An average person consumes about 250 milliliters of oxygen per minute and produces about 200 milliliters of carbon dioxide gas each minute. These values are referred to as minute oxygen consumption, VO2, and minute CO2 production, VCO2. Although it should seem obvious, realize that only a portion of each breath reaches the alveoli where gas exchange occurs. Between our lips and alveoli are anatomic dead space areas where gas exchange does not occur. And finally, to understand the important relationship between PCO2, CO2 production, and alveolar ventilation, you must first understand these three important concepts. First, we will assume that the amount of CO2 produced each minute is a stable and constant value. Second, the amount of CO2 removed from the body equals the amount of CO2 produced. The third concept is that the amount of CO2 removed from the body each minute equals the volume of alveolar ventilation per minute times the concentration of CO2 in alveolar gas. Putting this last point into the form of a mathematical equation, we can say that minute alveolar ventilation times a fraction of CO2 in alveolar gas equals minute CO2 production. This middle equation converts fraction CO2 to the more familiar pCO2 and this bottom equation lets us focus on the fact that pCO2 will vary inversely with minute alveolar ventilation. For example, if alveolar ventilation doubles, then pCO2 will be halved, and conversely, if alveolar ventilation is halved, then pCO2 will double. For those who like math equations, we can write that for a given patient, alveolar ventilation times pCO2 under one set of conditions will equal the product of alveolar ventilation and PCO2 under a different set of ventilatory conditions. We are now ready to address one more clinical problem and to wrap up this lesson. A patient presents with respiratory distress and is placed on mechanical ventilation. The ventilator is set to deliver tidal volume of 500 mL at a respiratory rate of 10 breaths per minute with 5 centimeters of water positive end expiratory pressure and an inspired oxygen concentration of 50%. Arterial blood gas analysis that shows pH equals 7.20, pCO2 equals 80 millimeters of mercury, and PO2 is fine, it's 95 millimeters of mercury. The question is, what one change can be made to these ventilator settings to correct the pH to 7.40? Well, this is actually fairly straightforward. The first step is to calculate serum bicarbonate concentration. We know that at a pH of 7.20, hydrogen ion concentration equals 64 nanomoles per liter. Since we know that PCO2 is currently 80, we can plug these values into our equation and find that bicarb equals 24 times 80 divided by 64, or serum bicarbonate concentration equals 30 millimoles per liter. The next step is to calculate our target PCO2. Using the same equation, we know that the bicarb is 30 and our target pH is 7.40 or 40 nanomoles per liter hydrogen ion concentration. So if we rearrange and solve for PCO2, we find that PCO2 equals 40 times 30 divided by 24, which equals a target PCO2 of 50 millimeters of mercury. Since our current PCO2 is 80 and our target is 50, and since PCO2 varies inversely with ventilation, we find that we must increase alveolar ventilation by a factor of 80 over 50, or 1.6 times in order to achieve our target pH. Recall that our initial ventilator settings are a tidal volume of 500 milliliters is delivered 10 times per minute. Because we desire to increase alveolar ventilation by a factor of 1.6, the simplest change to our ventilator setting would be to increase respiratory rate from 10 breaths per minute to 16 breaths per minute. This wraps up this video lesson on respiratory physiology where we considered three essential concepts. The first concept is that when CO2 is dissolved in an aqueous solution, there is a chemical equilibrium between CO2, hydrogen ion, and bicarbion. Since this is a buffer solution, we use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation or more precisely the Henderson equation, to obtain this important formula. 
And finally, we discussed the relationship between PCO2, CO2 production, and alveolar ventilation. We paid particular attention to the inverse relationship between PCO2 and alveolar ventilation. Congratulations on making it to the end of my first video lesson. I've realized that I have a lot to learn about making videos. If there is any interest, I'm considering making a series of pharmacology video lessons. Please leave your suggestions and comments below and give this video a like or subscribe if you would like to see more. Stay healthy and thank you.